Well, the models I've built to date have been either godly table models or flowchart models. Uh, of course, the whole uh, idea of building Minsky was to enable the two to be combined so we could do monetary modeling as well as physical modeling and economics and in any other discipline where that assists. So I'm going to build the, the, uh, my model of Minsky again, uh, starting from scratch, and also wherever it's, it's important to talk about financial transactions between parties, I'll use a godly table for that rather than a, uh, uh, just a, a set of equations on the flow chart. So I'll just actually title this banking sector. And I'm going to have, let's just open up, open up the table. And they're going to, of course, there's going to be debt. So it's going to use simply the word debt for that. Uh, I'm not going to have any other assets yet, so I'll leave the other assets free. And I'm going to have firms that are borrowing money, uh, workers that are being hired by firms to produce output, and then the banks uh, whose equity uh, is essential to them to be able to make loans in the first place. So let's say debt starts at 100 and there's 90 in the firm's accounts, five in the workers and the bankers, of course, necessarily have to have positive equity. So there's our initial starting conditions. And that also defines the, uh, uh, the, the primary bank accounts in the system. I'll just make this, uh, put this in editor mode so as I add the other details to the model, then we can add additional rows here and see it on the canvas rather than having to go over to the godly tab and see it over here instead. So starting from that point, let's just start to, uh, uh, from the same basic idea as I did uh, in the previous model where I built the Goodwin model and then Minsky model on top of it, I'm going to start from net investment. So I underscore N for net investment here, and that's the flow which we'll have to define um, as we go through the rest of the model. But the basic idea is that net investment integrated becomes the capital stock. So we next need a capital stock variable here. I'm going to rename that to K. And then in net investment uh, integrated is capital stock. We need an initial level of capital stock. So I'm going to cheating to check another model here to see what I did in the past. I made a couple of stuff ups as I chose arbitrary numbers uh, in previous simulations. So I'll try to avoid that hassle here. By the way, notice the square cursor, that's for grabbing things and moving them around. Sometimes Minsky doesn't reset, just press the shift key and we'll go back to the right one. And now I have K underscore zero for the initial level of capital. I'm gonna give that a value of 200 and that's a parameter. I won't bother with the range. You can see the default ranges are huge in Minsky. Maybe, maybe just, just to stop that interfering uh, with the simulations by press the key accidentally at the wrong time. Then I'll just start this off with 1,000 to 100 in the step size of 10. And then drag and link that up to the capital stock. Let's just zoom in a bit while I do this. So there's your initial uh, investment. Um, then you get capital stock. Multiply this by the efficiency with which machinery uh, turns energy into useful work. And I'll get at a value of 0 0.33, which is the inverse of one uh, uh, inverse of uh, three, which is the usual value that I provide for the, uh, the uh, accelerator relationship between capital and output. I get a, a maximum value of uh, 0.45, minimum of 0.1, uh, not quite like that low. And a step size of 1%. Okay, the modify, and I'll put to, um, no, I'll leave it there. Modify that by uh, capital stock by the efficiency of conversion of energy into useful work. That's what then gives us our output, which I'll just use the symbol Y for. And now we go through the, the rest of the uh, proceedings. I'll, I made it slightly more complicated in the last model because I included my uh, labor the labor into this model by having a capital output rate, capital to labor ratio which I think is more realistic rather than an output to labor ratio. But for simplicity here, I'll go for an output to labor ratio here. And that's uh, a, uh, a variable growing over time. So I need a differential block for it. Edit this, call this A, and then have, take a, right click, take a copy of A, 
multiply that by alpha, which is the rate of growth of uh, labor, the uh, output to labor ratio. I'll just actually edit this now that I've got a separate instance and call it the output to labor ratio. And then multiply that by alpha, which is the parameter for the rate of growth of technology effectively. Given a maximum value of say of 4%, minimum zero step size of 0 0.001. So those two multiply together. Going to give us the level of uh, technology, but I've got to have an initial level as well. And for the, uh, we're just going to use a zero for that, a underscore zero. Hang on, I typed that potentially on the, I didn't say so, let's try again. A, hang on, what's going on? Shift key, okay. A underscore zero. Parameter, initial value just of, of one. I'll give myself a bit of a range to play with. Just in case I need to. So there's A0 that feeds into your initial condition. So we've now defined uh, um, labor productivity. And so then we now can take a copy of A from here and then divide labor by, we divide GDP by that. And that's going to tell us how many workers are hired. So we're getting close to the stage where we need a gobbly table here. Uh, so that now gives us L, which is the number of the workers employed. And now I want to divide that by population, which again is going to be a variable that grows over time. So call this N for the number of people. Oh, whoops, let's just edit that. I'm going to rename all instances rather than running the dangers of that stuffing up things later. So that's got rid of anything inside the code of Minsky that still had in there. So same basic idea. I'll take a copy of N. Now you're going to multiply it by beta for the rate of growth of population. Let's say it's quite a high rate with 3% maximum. 4%, minimum of zero, step size 1%. So now I have beta n multiplied together and integrated is the value of n and I need n zero. And I'm gonna use, and this is why I was checking my numbers earlier to see what I started with. Let's just go back and take a look, 110. Okay, so n now. Got to click on the canvas, I think that was what was going on. N underscore zero. That's a parameter, and I'm giving that a value of 110. So now, copy of N, divide L by that. We have the employment rate which I use lambda for. And now we're getting to the point where the gobby table is going to start becoming relevant. Just checking my other model as I, I build this, so I don't make any big stuff up. So I want to finish this one rather than having to come back and do it again. It's happened a couple of times. Okay. Okay. So now let's just calculate this as it stands. I have, I, I have initial capital here, so I'm going to get output and I've got labor. The employment rate comes out at 66%, uh, which is roughly where I wanted to start with. Um, yeah, I'll leave it at that level. Okay, so now I want to, uh, again, notice that square cursor effect. Take a copy of lambda, and now I'm going to have Z, lambda as before Z, underscore backslash lambda and I've misspelled that so let's go and fix it up before it, we give it to Minsky to interpret lambda as a parameter value of 0 0.6 
So subtract lambda from subtract z lambda from lambda, you work out whether the, the employment rates above or below the level of where wages are affected. Um, then multiply it by a slope, and have s underscore lambda. Do that a value of 10. And just to be slightly more explicit, you multiply the two together, that is giving you the rate of change of wages. So I can actually express that. I just have a variable say dw backslash uh, slash dt, and that's now the rate of change of wages. And then if I multiply that by the current level of wages, which we now have to ring in as another integral block. So I can type the ampersand and do that very quickly, bring it up on screen. Call this W for the money wage. And then we have uh, DW DT, which comes out of the work down below. This bit. Copy of, copy of, uh, of, of uh, W. So those two multiplied together and integrated are equal to the current wage. And we need W zero. And I set that at uh, 0.7. So now I need a W0. Again, that square cursor effect. W underscore zero. Parameter 0.7 for initial value. Okay. So now we're getting to the point where I'm actually going to bring in uh, uh, wages because we now have labour times the um, wage rate multiplied together is total wage bill and I'll just use W, capital W for that. So it's capital W, capital w. Now I get to the point where I can actually start using the godly table we define up above. So I'll just call that W there and then go to the godly table and bring up the godly table. Pardon me, that's a bug in the old version. You won't see that when you use the new version. So pay wages. So wages are going to be a flow of minus W from here to W for workers. And that, um, of course, we now have consumption by workers. That was implicit in my original uh, Minsky model, but I'm not going to make it explicit here. So that's me consumption coming out of uh, the firm's account and goes into the, comes out of the worker's account, and goes into the firm's account. Now, I now have to define CW on the canvas. So let's just make the canvas a bit smaller. So I can actually show the browser window as well. Amazing how fast you can get um, parameters and variables turning up here. So now I've got CW, uh, and the easy way to define CW, which I'll change later, is to say that workers just consume all their wages. That's the standard um, assumption made by Koleski. So for the heck of it, I'm going to just use that here. If I hit my reset key over here, then you'll see the flows into that is workers' accounts are the same with the flows out, so they won't accumulate any money. Um, the later one I'm going to do is change this so that there's a time delay in workers' consumption, and that's controlled through the uh, um, through the Godly table. But that's simplified it fairly effectively here. Now we have wages, uh, subtract wages from output, and you're going to get gross profit, so I'll just indicate that as pi underscore g. So backslash pi underscore g for gross. That's gross profits. And then now we have um, uh, the firm is going to, should I use gross profits or I just, yeah, yeah, use gross profits, okay. So now of course the firm's gonna be paying interest. So go back to the godly table here and we have debt I haven't included, in fact, in there that pay interest on the debt. So that's going to be necessary. So that's going to be a minus 
INC out of here, INC going over to the bankers. And again, the same basic idea uh, is that I want spending by banks. So I'm going to have minus C underscore B for consumption by banks. That goes, of course, to the firm sector. And now again, for simplicity, I've now got interest to find. So I bring interest, and these are all in alphabetical order here. So just look that way, there's interest. Uh, and that is equal to the rate of interest. So I'm going to call this R underscore, R underscore D for debt. Uh, one of the hassle, the debt and deposits using the same character is a bit of a pain. You know, make this a parameter, say 5%. Maximum 20. So RD, and I've now got debt there, of course. So I've got to bring debt down. And those are interest payments. And now if I subtract interest from gross profits, I get net profits. So backslash capital P I underscore N for net. Now there's net profits, and now we have investment, the desire to invest. And that's going to depend on the rate of profit. So I was literally just going to now define the rate of profit. So take a copy of uh, that's words name is K over here. Divide net profit by the capital stock and you have the rate of profit. And now I want an investment function, similar to what I did with wages a moment ago and what I've done beforehand. So I'm now gonna have, I'm just gonna check and make sure I don't uh, give myself a need to redefine the damn thing if I make an error. So just give me a check and just check that, I do. Okay, so I'm going to use my Z, my, my zero point for, again, that square bracket, just press the shift key. Once you're actually on the canvas. So Z underscore backslash PI superscript R. Parameter, give that a value of 3%, so 3% Firms don't invest anything. Above that, they do, and at a certain level, they start to um, uh, invest um, by borrowing money. So we have actual profit rate versus this target profit rate. Subtract the two, you've got the gap between the actual profit rate and the level at which capitalists don't invest any money. You then modify that by a slope of the investment function. Another parameter, give that a value of 10. Multiply those two together, whoops. Now you have gross investment as a percentage of GDP. And multiply that by GDP. Hang on a second, let's see what I did here. Ah. Okay, we had a version uh, where grouping was done. Group, I haven't shown grouping yet because there are a couple of hassles in grouping. Uh, we're fixing them up with the next beta release. So um, just to avoid those hassles, I'm not using them here, but it's quite possible to um, um, use a grouping to hide some of the complexity here. Uh, we still have them available for lay views. So there's gross investment now. So why are those two up? 
So now we've got something from which we can then have borrowing turning up. So we have uh, gross investment and net profit, which are here. So I'll just now take, again, that, that cursor. Okay, take a copy of gross investment. An investment minus, pro, minus net, sorry, gross investment and net profits can be deducted together because gross investment is talking about um, what you actually borrow money to do, to build, and then you have uh, depreciation, meaning you've got replacement costs as well. So it's gross investment I subtract here rather than net investment. So now minus gross in investment. And what you have now is the rate of change of debt, but we already have, we already, um, we have debt in the, in the equation up here. So what I want to have now is credit. So I'm going to type credit as a variable. And that can be positive or negative. If investment is greater than profits and credit is going to be positive. If it's less, it's going to be negative. We now go back to the godly table, which is here. And I now want to show uh, credit. And that is going to be credit dollars that turns up here as the finance, but it also of course turns up as debt here. So now we have the stock flow consistent treatment of the, well, the Minsky model I built way back in the early 90s, uh, but going through the godly table to show the stock flow consistency. At the moment, let's just hit the recalculate key and see what happens. Okay, there's going to be positive borrowing coming out of that. So now we have uh, credit, we have gross investment, and I now need to uh, define net investment. So take a copy of gross investment, whack it down here. Let's just uh, change the scale a bit. So that minus depreciation is going to give us um, total uh, um, net investments are going to have go that modified by delta underscore k. I give a value for that of six percent. So that multiplied by that is depreciation. We now type a minus key and then wire up gross investment minus appreciation is net investment. And I think that's, strangely enough, I think that's the whole, what's over here? Let's see, what have I got here? Uh, pi n, so I just must have accidentally defined that once before. I'm just gonna hit the run key. And I've got negative amounts turning up there. So I've got to, do something more to see what I got wrong in the previous model, which gives me fine values. Uh, hit the recalculate key. Consumption by banks, which I haven't included. Okay, so what I have to have there, the simplest way to do it is to say that consumption by banks is equal to the interest payments. So bring that down here and wire that up like so. And now when I simulate, I guess stop it and go forward. I'm still getting negative debt there and the system is freezing. So I'm doing something wrong. Let me just check and see the other model that I got right before I did this one. Always stuff up when you do a live demo. Uh, hmm, okay. Let's go back and show what I actually wanted to build. Because again, these things, it's easy to make a mistake as you start building a model. So let's just run this one to show that I actually got it right. We have rising debt, rising amount of money in firms accounts. And what I've done differently to um, the uh, model that I've built up here so far is that I've got a, uh, a delay between consumption by workers and the equal wages for workers consumption using what's called a first order time lag. So that, I can find that that is actually shown here. So rather than having workers spending their wages, so I could have wages here going to consumption, I've got the amount in the bank balance 
divided by a parameter, which is called the time constant, that tells you how long workers could survive effectively without, uh, without getting any income. And that is a tiny number, uh, which indicates they could survive uh, 0.4 of a year, which is about two weeks. Whereas we've got capitalists being able to save one point, uh, bankers being able to survive 1.5 years. So a, a bigger effective buffer builds up in the bank's account, even though uh, they are a, a smaller component of the spending in the economy. So that's what I wanted to get to. And I'm just gonna go back and see what the if did I do wrong to, um, to not get the outcome that I've got shown up here. You can see it's, it's a, I've got more elements in the model. So I may not have actually defined extra elements that I needed to define. Uh, so it's looking at the overall model. You see what I did wrong to get that wrong, that different result there. I'm not really sure. Um, this is the sort of thing I need to sit down and work it out properly. Uh, so I, I might leave it at that and show that the models can be combined. And I'll, leave, I'll, I'll put the, uh, the finished one that I did up on my Patreon page as well. But the basic idea is this is just the beginning of integrating a physical model with a monetary model. And uh, of course, I'm also leaving out price dynamics here. Effectively, I'm assuming that price is a constant. Uh, it's fairly easy to add price dynamics inside here using a Kolesky and pricing equation. And then your monetary transfers have different um, numbers, of course, to the physical values of the economy. You have inflation, deflation, and so on turning up. Um, but, and of course, this is a toy model. You get far more sophisticated models being made by some of the people who are using Minsky seriously now. So the, this, this biggest model we have is probably the one of the Portuguese economy. Second biggest would be Ty, Ty Keynes's model of uh, the pandemic model. They're using a godly table to create a model of epidemiology. Um, but so the basic story is it's extremely easy to integrate the two. You've got to obviously take more time than I was able to check my values as I type this thing in live, but you fundamentally get um, the, uh, the dynamics of a, of a capitalist economy coming out of this, including the monetary sector, which of course neoclassicals omit. I'll leave it at that. And um, um, I might uh, maybe do a supplementary model where I check and see what I, where I made a mistake to get the trends being negative in borrowing there rather than positive for the entire system. Well, one of the things that Minsky adds uniquely is the capacity to see your equations as you build the model. And it, I wasn't able to spot the problem easily looking on the flow chart. Uh, but it was obvious when I looked at the equation because my definition for the rate of change of wages, which is if I can find where that is here. Uh, yeah, I had, uh, but sorry, rate of change of wages is the slope of the function multiplied by it should be the slope multiplied by lambda minus yz. So what happened was in putting the model together and talking at the same time, I didn't realize I'd type the divide by key there rather than a, a, a minus key. So I did delete that. Now wire this up to here and then hit the run key. And then we get rather different dynamics. So um, this is showing the effect of the dynamics of this model are pretty much the same as the one of the completed model that I was working to beforehand, except for that little mistake. Um, so um, again, it's very useful to have uh, this capacity to go and check and see, well, what have I written in terms of equations versus what I've done here? And we hope to at some point add the capacity to actually see expressions like this as an equation on screen rather than the flow chart, because sometimes it is hard, hard to read a flow chart and realize what you've actually done. Um, so the final thing I'm going to do is just run the model for a few cycles and show that the Koleskian assumption that workers spend all their wages match with bankers doing the same thing means that there's no activity over here and you can't include any financial dynamics for the, um, for the workers or the banks in the model. So what I do instead is let's just delete that wire and delete that wire and now define consumption by workers and consumption by bankers as a function of the amount of money in their bank accounts. So I'm just going to go across to the browser again and bring over workers, which is the bank account for workers and banks, which is the bank account for the banks out of which they can spend and say that each of them have time lags. 
the time, genuinely time lags rather than time delays as most economists use, uh, which are reflecting the length of time they could survive without having to get any more income into their account. So the time constant for bankers is going to be a large number because we expect they can survive, you know, say two years with no extra cash coming in, five years, uh, the maximum, so step size of one tenth of a year. So now I then divide the banker's account by tau B and what I'm going to get is their consumption level will be substantially less than five. Hit the recalculate key and I can see what that is. Okay, the workers uh, have much smaller bank balances. Uh, there's many more of them, but they, they take longer to, uh, uh, well, they, they've, they've got to spend more because they're poorer. So I now have tau underscore workers and argue they might be able to survive maybe a, a couple of, a couple of, uh, so two fortnights, uh, which is 0 0.04 of a year, roughly 0 0.05 or one tenth of a year, maximum, say, uh, a one twentieth of a year, maximum one tenth of a year, minimum a few days, step size of 0 0.01. And now their consumption will be much larger than the amount of money in their bank account. So they've got, you know, bankers and workers, as I put them here, have got the same amount of money in their accounts when the model starts, but the consumption by workers is going to be much higher than the consumption by bankers. So 100 versus 2.5. And this is one reason that money does not trickle down, it trickles up. If you want to put more money into the system, you put it in the hands of workers. Uh, just uh, run the model and you now see that the amount in the workers' accounts and the bankers' accounts changes over time, changes dynamically. Um, which you didn't get beforehand. And if you want to now extend the model and say, well, let's take a look at uh, government spending, for example, then what I'd need to do is create a new asset called reserves. And now what I have is, uh, let's say government spending. And let's just say that all goes, I'll, I'll just call it G underscore S for government spending. Let's say it all goes on workers. And then I could have taxation as well. And let's say that came out of the firm's accounts only. And now you're starting to get a more integrated model and I can include a response re reaction by the um, uh, government to the level of unemployment and so on and have that affecting the, the dynamics of the model and I could show the other uh, activities of other um, uh, sectors by expanding the tables to give you an idea of just how large they can get and I know this what I'm seeing here is a rather messy model whether well, you see Pedro Francis for uh, Portugal which Pedro is going to be I hope dramatically uh, revising when he puts his PhD in at some time in the near future. And this is a model which has been derived entirely from, from national accounts of, of Portugal. And it's more accurate than the model used by the uh, central bank or by the um, um, reserve bank of, of, um, of Portugal. But you've got an enormous model there. Um, you can see he's still using, uh, still has the variables turning up on the outside of the uh, uh, Godly tables, which we no longer require, and all the various bits and pieces of spider web, which is what we have rather than spaghetti code, uh, scattered all over the canvas. The, uh, the better way to go is to build models like the ones that um, um, Tyrone Kane builds, Kane's builds, where they're just in, in, in superb attention to the, um, to the layout of a model. So let's have a look at one of Ty's models here. And I'll go for the, um, uh, the pandemic model. And make that full screen. And that was an incredibly complicated model. It's quite much, much easier to follow the layout because you've got the capacity to zoom in and see how different the elements are defined or using a standard layout, well-documented and so on. So that's the sort of thing you need to do if you're going to make a model you intend showing 
to other people and saying, let's see if we can actually run an economy or a modeling a pandemic in Silicon before we try doing it in the real world.